Good morning. I uh, greet you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Um, so t- today's scripture is taken from uh, Acts 1 and it's verses 1 to 11, and it reads as follows. Dear Theophilus, the first book I wrote was about everything Jesus did and taught from the beginning until the day he was carried up into heaven. Before he went, he talked to the apostles he had chosen. With the help of the Holy Spirit, he told them what they should do. This was after his death, but he showed them that he was alive, proving it to them in many ways. The apostles saw Jesus many times during the 40 days after he was raised from death. He spoke to them about God's kingdom. One time when Jesus was eating with them, he told them not to leave Jerusalem. He said, wait here until you receive what the Father promised to send. Remember, I told you about it before. John baptized people with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. The apostles were all together. They asked Jesus, Lord, is this the time for you to give the people of Israel their kingdom again? Jesus said to them, The Father is the only one who has the authority to decide dates and times. They are not for you to know, but the Holy Spirit will come on you and give you power. You will be my witnesses. You will tell people everywhere everything about me, in Jerusalem, in the rest of Judea, in Samaria, and every part of the world. After Jesus said this, he was lifted up into the sky. While they were watching, he went into a cloud and they could not see him. They were staring into the sky where he had gone. Suddenly, two men wearing white clothes were standing beside them. They said, men from Galilee, why are you standing here looking into the sky? You saw Jesus carried away from you into heaven. He will come back in the same way you saw him go. This is the word of our Lord. Let us pray. Father God, I ask that you that you guard my words, Lord Jesus. I ask that anything I may say may be according to your truth, Father God. I pray that um, anything I may say may glorify Jesus Christ, glorify God the Father, and glorify the Holy Spirit. Amen. Right. Um, have you ever been forced to sit and wait? And you sit and wait on something. Maybe you're at the hospital waiting for a result waiting for a loved one to come out of surgery. You don't know what you will find out or what you will hear. Maybe you're waiting for a friend or family member to come visit, someone you haven't seen for a while. You may be excited. You may start to think about things that you guys, that you guys did together. Maybe you're waiting to see what will happen with COVID-19 and how it will continue to affect us. I personally don't like waiting. But waiting is a part of life. We are all waiting for something, but each thing we're waiting for is different. Sometimes God makes us wait. Sometimes we want to run ahead of God, don't want to wait for him to lead us. We hear it in everyday lives. We say, don't wait around. Don't do nothing. Do something. The reality is that sometimes we should not be doing something but rather waiting around for God. I'm not saying remain idle and grow stagnant. Do nothing even when we should be doing something. I'm referring to waiting for God. So what do we do while we are waiting on God? The Bible says a lot about that. There's a lot of waiting in the Bible, but we need to understand that each waiting is different. For hundreds of years, the Israelites have been waiting for a Messiah. After being conquered by the Babylonians, then the Persians, then Greeks, then Romans, the Israelites were waiting for King David's greatest son. They were waiting for this person who would lead them to freedom. This, of course, is not the kind of Messiah who is going to come. But even 40 days after Jesus had risen from the dead, Jesus' disciples had still expected this sort of Messiah. In Acts 1 verse 6, they they asked, Lord, is this the time when you will restore the kingdom to Israel? I'm sure we can understand this. Many of us have waited in eager anticipation something 
will be or something will happen a certain way, only to discover that it will be like something completely different. Jesus tells him that the Messiah will be a totally different sort of Messiah. Jesus says, it's not for you to know the times or periods that the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. There's the old saying that goes, if you want to make God laugh, tell him your plans. And yet we are assured in the Bible that God has good plans for us. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. And we read this in Jeremiah 29 verse 11. A second sort of waiting is despairing, despairing waiting. The type of despairing waiting we have on Good Friday and Holy Saturday. The disciples go to the upper room and lock the doors for fear of the Jews. We may have had this sort of waiting. We are waiting for something that feels so terrible that you would rather run away than face reality. Rather look backwards than forwards. Look at was instead of what is coming. We still see a trace of this in today's reading. He was going and they were gazing up towards heaven. They are looking at Jesus disappearing, hanging on to every last glass of him, clinging on to that glimpse of his feet. Physically their eyes may be on the scars, but in reality they are looking backwards. They were thinking, wasn't it great when Jesus walked among us? A Dominican friar called Richard Unsworth once said, something I found myself saying a lot recently. I suppose because I've finally understood something I ought to have figured out years ago is that we shouldn't ever say that Jesus came back from the dead. This isn't because I don't believe in the resurrection, but because I don't like the word back. Jesus didn't come back to life. He went forwards to life, the new life of the new creation. You would notice, wouldn't you, if, you were, if there were two angels standing next to you, the disciples are so busy looking backwards, trying to hold on to Jesus' feet, that they don't even notice the angel standing next to them. The angel said in Acts 1 verse 1, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up to heaven? God doesn't want us to focus on what he did in the past. God wants us to look to what he is going to do in the future. On the day of Pentecost, more people became followers of Jesus than had become his followers during his whole earthly ministry. Wasn't it great when Jesus walked among us? Yes, of course it was. But it's even greater what he has done since he went back to heaven. God doesn't want us to look to what he has done in the past. God wants us to look to what he is going to do in the future. Then there is the expectant form of waiting. He ordered them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father. In Acts 1 verse 4, it says, You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. We are called to wait on God, to listen to God, to pray and to wait to be filled with the Holy Spirit. There are two possible dangers. We can rush out without securing what we have to do in prayer, or we can use praying as an excuse for not doing Imagine if the disciples hadn't waited until Pentecost. On the day of Pentecost, more people became followers of Jesus than had become his followers during his whole earthly ministry. None of that would have happened if the disciples had just tried to do it on their own strength. But equally, what if on the day of Pentecost the disciples had said, let's not go out, let's pray a bit longer. Then 3,000 people would not have been added to their number that day. Mother Teresa said she spent an hour a day praying, but then she went out and did amazing things. We don't pray to avoid doing. We pray so that with God's guidance, we may do things in God's strength. So in summary, what do we do when we wait? The first thing we do is pray. We often forget 
the importance of prayer in our times of waiting on God. We will often pray about a subject once and then never bring it before God again. God honors our persistent prayer. God doesn't always answer our prayers right away. Sometimes he answers with an immediate yes or an immediate no. But I've found that more often he answers with his third response, wait. While we don't want to run ahead of God, we also don't want to remain idle and grow stagnant either. The second thing we do is study the word. How many of your questions and concerns pertaining to this virus are answered in scripture? Sometimes we seem to have many more questions and answers in life. We pray and pray for an answer and seem never to find it. Many times the answer to our questions are in the Bible. During these challenging days, we must continue to study the scripture. Study the scripture individually and together. And the third thing we do is work. The apostles were one man short because of Judas's betrayal and suicide. Scriptures and Psalms told them to choose his replacement. There were two requirements for the successor. One, he had to have had a part of Jesus' earthly ministry. And two, he had to be a witness to the ascension. The apostle cast lots, which was a common Old Testament practice, to determine which one of the two men were to be chosen. Matthias was chosen. So in conclusion... I want you to notice that not only did the apostles pray and study while they were waiting, but they also continued to take care of business that needed to be done. Although everything that is normal for us has changed very quickly, don't just hang out. You are to pray, study and act. It is time for the church to be the church. Let us pray. Father God, I thank you that... Um, we are able to meet um, and, 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 and well, share your word, Father God. And um, I thank you for this privilege. Lord Jesus, I um, ask that you guide us, Father God. And, and even though we, we, we're waiting and, and, and in some cases be sitting around and, uh, and we're forced to wait, Father God, um, I pray that you guide us and that um, we, you, you help us to realize that um, we still need to pray, we still need to do your work, and we still need to study your word, Father God. Lord Jesus, I also... I thank you that um, you kept us safe in this past week and I ask that you keep us safe in the week to come for the God. And also, Lord Jesus, anybody that may be affected or infected with the virus, Father God, I ask that you pray uh, that you be with them and that you guard them and that you, you make your presence felt, Father God. And then, Lord Jesus, um, anybody that um, or any families that may have lost a loved one because of this, uh, this virus, I ask that you also be with them and that make, and make your presence felt. And Father God, anybody that may be um, going through a difficult time, they may be ill, we know that you are the great healer, you are the great physician, physician, physician Father God, and that, um, and that you can heal them, Lord Jesus, and I pray that you do. And Father God, anybody that may be battling financially, I ask that you, that you be with them as well and that you, that you help them so that they may put food on the table and, and make ends meet. Father God, I, I pray this in your almighty and wonderful name. Amen.